you won't feel guilty uh, if your hearts were not a flutter during the reading of our gospel a moment ago. It's not very interesting. It's a genealogy of Jesus. But it's a list, right? It's a list of names. It's a list of weird names. Uh, I imagine from the author's standpoint that this chapter of Matthew must have been, been a very frustrating one for Matthew to write in the days prior to um, spell check and copy and paste in Word documents. I can see the waste paper basket next to Matthew as he uh, is, is writing out his gospel, just filling up with pieces of papyrus as he keeps making mistakes uh, going through the list. You learn pretty early in classes on biblical preaching uh, to avoid the lists, okay? Avoid the lists. They're deadly. Don't preach from the lists. They're not very interesting. But I mean, they, I suppose they could be sort of interesting. I was in Florida this summer, uh, you may remember, for the National Convention. And I was, um, I spent some time there. I have an aunt and uncle, my uncle Jim and Aunt Terry, they live there. And I was staying at their house one night and visiting with them, and it was late, uh, and uh, my Aunt Terry had gone to bed, and my uncle uh, Jim and I stayed up later. And I noticed in uh, the room that I was staying in, there were all these file cabinets, okay? Um, and I started asking my Uncle Jim at about 1.30 in the morning, um, hey, what are all those file cabinets in, in, my, uh, in the bedroom that I'm staying in? He said, oh, those are lists of uh, genealogies. I, I do a bunch of genealogy work on our family. And, um, and they're, they're not particularly interesting. I said, well, can, we just, can you show me a few of them? And so he went in the room and he, uh, and he started pulling out the file cabinets. And he just had books and books, I mean, thousands upon thousands of pages of information on my, uh, my family members. The distant relatives on my mother's side of the family uh, have a long and kind of illustrious history in the United States and throughout kind of Scandinavia and Europe. And he was walking me through all of this information and these lists and these pictures and we were engulfed in it. And by, uh, by about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, I said to my Uncle Jim, this is fascinating, but I have a plane to catch in two hours. <laughs> but as we looked through the list, there, you know, ship captains on the, uh, on the eastern shores of the United States, early American politicians, whalers, mill workers, authors, military men, and we have pictures of all these people. Uh, my uncle Jim, or one, somebody in my family has, a, has a, a, an old sea chest from one of the uh, ship captains in my, uh, in my family. There are pictures of my great-grandmother uh, and great-grandfather during, during the early 1900s. They had bought a, a very expensive camera at the time. And so there are all of these fascinating pictures of them when they first met one another and started dating and started getting married. I mean, it, it, you could look at those file cabinets and just think, it's a list, right? But kind of an interesting list, actually. Now, there are also uh, no shortage of vices and tragedies and sad stories uh, and terrible things that happen throughout the list and throughout the genealogies as we pulled out file cabinets. My Uncle Jim would tell me sad stories of addiction and abandonment and adultery and all sorts of things. And he just laid out the good and the bad and the ugly. And that's kind of what lists and genealogies do. You just can't really escape them. But it's just a list, right? Until you know the story behind it. Then it becomes something else. It becomes a long story 
in shorthand that has something to say to you. I suppose that Matthew 1 might not be so bad, actually. Um, it, like the genealogies of my Uncle Jim, have a story to tell. I could get interested in the kind of family tree of Jesus because it gives a sociological and historical profile of the Son of God and the Savior of the world. It's not just a list. It may be a list until you start to hear the story behind it. Then it becomes something else. A long story in shorthand that has something to say to you and to say to me. Now, I don't expect you to remember all the names, uh, Aminadab and Shealtiel and Zerubbabel and all of these people's stories, but some of them you will. Some of them you will remember and will recall. And it's good to think through those stories because each of them teach us something about the story of God in our lives. Here's the first thing that I think it teaches us. It teaches us that the family of God is one motley crew of people, just like my family. Okay? You've got travelers and, uh, and waiters like Abraham and Sarah. You have foreigners and immigrants like Ruth. You have people of ill repute uh, but good character like Rahab. You have royalty in mass and prophets like David and like Solomon. You have refugees and exiles in Jesus' background, uh, like Shealtiel and Zerubbabel. And you have a poor little carpenter and a handmaiden named Joseph and Mary. And when I look at that list, it gives me hope that amidst the grand diversity of God's family that you see in the genealogy of Jesus, that there may just be enough room for me too, and you too. An American, thousands of years later, from a different time, a different history, a different past, it's easy to start to look at the list and say like, hey, these people are all across the map. God's family seems to be pretty big, pretty diverse, pretty weird, pretty strange. My family is pretty diverse and weird and strange. Maybe I wouldn't be that uncommon in Jesus' family. And you would be right. The second thing I think it has to teach us is that the Bible is not a book of heroes and heroics. It is a book filled with flawed men and women, cracked vessels, sinking ships, Men and women who soar high one minute and then nosedive the next. It's absolutely filled with people like that. So we can look at Abraham and think like, oh, he's the father of the faith. He's the one that left Ur and traveled to the new land. He put all of his hopes in God. He took this one promise of God and set out on that. What a wonderful example. Man, he was awesome. What a hero. But if you go back and read his story... Ah, you can start to scratch your head a little bit. I mean, he committed adultery against his wife because he didn't believe in the promises of God and, uh, and fathered an illegitimate child against the will and desire of the Lord. He lied about his wife and was a coward and said uh, to the king of Israel that his wife Sarah was his sister because he was afraid to stand up for her name. Not so much of a hero uh, in my book, necessarily. Jacob, who was one of the patriarchs, one of the kind of founding fathers of the people of Israel, a man of great stature, a man whom the promises of God came through, stole that birthright, stole that inheritance through thievery and trickery from his brother and his father. He lied, he cheated, he disobeyed the fourth commandment and the sixth commandment. I mean, like, the guy's not doing 
too hot. The Bible's not a book of heroes. David, the most famous king of all of Israel, the mighty warrior of God who had a heart for God and a heart for his people and a heart for the praise and knowledge and following after of God, was a coward. He was a man that when he was supposed to be on the battlefields, took off and went back home, formed an illegitimate relationship with somebody else's wife, fathered an illegitimate child, and then had the man killed who was the, the, the actual husband of this woman. And Matthew tells us so, right? Listen to that. If you, if you just look at verse 6, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of not David, whom you would expect, but Uriah. Not exactly a heroic moment for David, right? Solomon started off well, wiser than any man, but gave up his wisdom for foolishness in order to form foreign allegiances uh, and, and have foreign wives by the thousands uh, when he should have been following God as Israel's king. Not exactly heroics in my mind, right? Manasseh, one of the other kings of Israel, who was absolutely the worst king, took all of the churches and all of the altars and all the places of worship that were filled in, uh, that were scattered throughout Israel, and set up all sorts of religions and other foreign gods for people to worship. Not exactly a hero of the faith. The Bible's not a book of heroes. It's not a book of the heroics of heroes. And surprisingly, that gives me hope, too, actually. That amidst my countless flaws, Jesus might not be ashamed to call me a part of his family. Look back at your own history whether it's uh, uh, family members or, uh, or past relatives or your own life? Is it marked by heroics, great faith, uh, just an upstanding life and career uh, and an upstanding relationship with God your whole life? No. And I would encourage you and I to be honest about our past just like Matthew is honest about the past of the people of God. Saying, we're not heroes. We're not full of heroics. We aren't the high and mighty of the world. We didn't do everything or really anything right. God gave it to us and we sort of wrecked it. But nonetheless, nevertheless, that great gospel word, God continued to pursue his people, not letting them down. And that's Matthew's genealogy, genealogical point that he's saying is that through each of these people who uh, were great sometimes and failed other times, God continued to work through each of their stories. And he continues to work through yours too. That's the point of the genealogy. It's not a list. Don't call it a list. It's a long story that's trying to tell you something in shorthand about your story. I think also... The genealogy of Matthew teaches us that the past does not have to define the future, okay? That your past does not have to be the thing that defines who and what you are right now. How important of a point is that for us? I mean, how many of us just live out of the guilt and shame and hopelessness of our own lives and the things that we have done or the things that have been done to us? Right? You can, you can go back not very far in your own family sometimes and think, man, there were a lot of people who hurt me. There were a lot of things that I don't want to see continue, but I continue to see kind of lived out in my own life and in my own existence. The genealogy of Matthew, this list, teaches us that the past does not have to be the end of it, does not have to be the final say, that in Christ the way it began does not have to be the way that things end. Do you have a family member who harmed you? Do you have your own, uh, like, do you have your own hurt and own self-harm that's sort of identified and you live out of those pains and those scars? 
The genealogy of Matthew says the end is better than the means by which you got there. Right? That's the story. And the final thing that I think the genealogy of Matthew teaches us is that the Bible is not a, the story of a bunch of heroes, but the story of one hero. Okay? Consider how the, end of, uh, how the genealogy of, of, uh, of Matthew ends and the genealogy of Jesus ends here. Joseph was the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Christ. Do you know what Jesus' name means? Uh, Jesus is the Aramor, so, so like it would be pronounced Yeshua in, uh, in kind of the Greek and Aramaic language. That is uh, the name, the Aramaic name for Joshua. Okay? Joshua in the Old Testament means very simply God saves. I sometimes think that that is the point and the meaning of the end of this, this whole genealogy. It's not a list of heroes. It's not a list of the high and mighty. It is the list of the people whom God saves. It's the people, uh, uh, it's the list of the people of whom God loves. The people of whom God redeems and works through. And the list actually goes on. Matthew, Matthew doesn't record it for us here. Uh, he wouldn't know how big the list would get. But from Jesus, uh, Paul says that Jesus was the firstborn of many brothers. Okay? Many brothers, many other family members who would come from him. Their names were things like Peter and Paul and, uh, and, and Simon and Andrew uh, and you and me. The list goes on and on and on forever, this great and grand genealogy. Peter says that you and I have been born to a living hope. Okay? And the living hope is in that name of Jesus. That name that finishes all things. That name that says, even though your past seems to be a wreck, even though your life seems to be a mess, even though your genealogy and family tree is an absolute mess of chaos and wired branches, that's not the end of the story. That God's name is the final name. It is a list of the people whom Jesus saves. That's the hope of Advent. And that's our hope today. That we are born and live in this living hope in the name of Jesus, whom saves us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are our hope. You are the God of hope. Uh, and the God who brings hope into our lives. Uh, may the past uh, not define the present. May we live in the resurrection power and the living hope of Jesus Christ who renames us uh, from a broken people to a people whom God saves. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.